Luke 23 verses 32 to 43 says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others, let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him, which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself from us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Good morning, church. Long bumper there, so sorry about that. So, hey, uh, just welcome. I just want to say good morning to everybody, for everybody who's watching online. Welcome. I'm just so happy that everybody's here today. Happy Mother's Day for all you mothers. And where's Cindy? Cindy, so it's happy for her. I'm talking a foreign language to Cindy because she's not from the Bronx. So it's happy Mother's Day. It's happy Mother's Day to you, Cindy. Uh, happy Mother's Day. I know, get, go get your coffee. So uh, we are still continuing in our series. We're going through a four-part series on the last words of Jesus on the cross. And we want to go through that. And we want to understand how important some of those last things that Jesus has said. So as we go through this study and the power of words, the power of the words of Jesus, I want you to focus on some of those last words, those actual last words that we just read, that today you will be with me in paradise. How many of you want to hear those words? How many of you want to hear that Jesus is asking you to be with him in paradise? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So with that, how often do you think about death? How often does that thought cross your mind? And maybe as we get older, maybe that thought becomes a little bit more prevalent in our mind of when is God going to call us home? How is God going to call us home? It would be great if we could orchestrate our own death. We could pick the time. We could pick the place. We could get just something that we can do. Because there are some things, that, some ways that we do know we don't want to die. We know we don't want to burn. We don't want to drown. We don't want to be in severe pain or illness. Those are things that we don't want to do. But sometimes, you know, God chooses our time. But how often have you thought about how you would like to die? Most of us would probably say, in our sleep. We just want to go to sleep and wake up with Jesus the next day. Wouldn't that just be wonderful? That would be the perfect opportunity for all of us. A friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, told me this story. He had a member of his church, had been a member of the church for many, many years. And she decided to take her family on vacation to the, some people will say, the happiest place on earth, right here in Orlando, Florida, to Disney World. So she's there with her two children and their grandchildren, and they are just having a wonderful time enjoying Disney. Towards the end of the day, she started to get a little winded. So she sat down on a bench, and the children looked, and she said, you know, she looks a little pale. They convinced her to go to the ER. She goes to the ER, and the doctor at the ER says, she's fine, she's just got a little tired. Maybe we should just keep her overnight to be in a safe side. And she says, no, no, I want to go home with my family. So they don't go home, because they lived up in Ohio. They decide to go back to Disney. They go back to Disney, they enjoy a nice dinner, a lot of more laughter and time with, fam with friends, and they just had another great day, a great remembrance for the entire family. She goes to the hotel room, goes to sleep, and doesn't wake up. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty good way to go. 
I mean, you, you spend your whole day with your children and your grandchildren. You have a happy day. You wake up. You go to sleep, and you wake up with Jesus. That's a pretty good deal if we could only choose how we were going to go. I think most of us would probably choose that way. So we all want to, at some point in time to get into the Father's house. So if that was you, and you were in Disney, and you weren't feeling ill, if you were feeling ill, and you, and you go to bed that night, where would you wake up? Do you know? Are you absolutely 100% sure where you're going to wake up if you die in your sleep tonight? That's a question that one of all of us need to ask ourselves on a regular basis. You may balk at the question, but you have to give it some very serious thought. It is really the, probably the most important question you will ever ask of yourselves. Because when your life is over, you're going to spend your life in one of two places, eternity, either in heaven or in hell. Now, some people think when they die, you either go to heaven or you just don't exist anymore. No. Scripture tells us there's also a place called Gehenna. It's hell. Do you want, and that is where you will spend eternity with Satan, with the gnashing of teeth and all that stuff that Jesus talked about. Those are your two choices. One, heaven. Two, hell. You get to choose. We all get to choose. And that's really where we're going to focus our message on today. So this morning, we're going to go back to the cross. We're going to go back to Calvary. And we want to take a look at it from the perspective of the two thieves on the cross. One of them gets to go with Jesus to paradise, and the other one doesn't. So we're going to answer the question, what does it take to be acceptable to God? Why did Jesus say to one, today you will be with me in paradise, and to the other, he didn't? Why? So in most of the stories that you read, or you read when you're a kid, there's always the black hats and the white hats. If you remember Cowboy is in Indianism, most of you are old enough to remember those days. Uh, you always had the good guys and the bad guys. For today's stories, one of the bad guy actually wins. You know, when our, you know, growing up and we're reading our books and everything, the bad guy always lost. The guy with the white hat on, he always won. Whether it was the Lone Ranger or the Green Hornet or whoever it happened to be, they always won. But today's story, one of the evil people, one of the bad guys actually wins. Now, you may think, well, he wasn't a bad guy because he actually became a good guy before he was saved. But that's a story for another day. So the undes this undeserving robber gets to choose to spend eternity with Jesus. So Jesus has just been tried. He is led to Golgotha. He's nailed to a cross. And that's where we're going to pick up our story today. So if you want to open up your Bibles, Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 39, we're going to be looking at this story and what was just read up on the uh, screen earlier. We know from last week that Jesus is crucified with two robbers, one on his left and one on his right. Jesus says, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. The people hurl insults at Jesus. They mock him. They beat him. The soldiers put up a stick with vinegar on it to give him something to drink. And then we read this in Luke chapter 23, verses 39 to 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, I take you. I choose you. Do you remember growing up, going down to the local field, park, schoolyard, maybe playing some baseball or football with your friends? You all get down there, you pick a time and day when you go, and maybe you did it in gym class or physical education class. You would line up and there'd be two captains. 
And one would say, all right, I want that guy. And the other one, I want that guy. And you'd start to choose sides for the game that you were going to play. And there was always that one little scrawny kid in the corner that people would always say, well, I don't want him. I want to make sure I don't get him. And they choose sides. And you don't want to be that last person called. Remember that? Well, guess what? I was always the last person called. I was a very gawky, thin, uncoordinated person, and that's why I always got chosen last. Now, luckily, as I told you guys, I have an identical twin brother. So sometimes he was last and sometimes I was last. It would all be a matter of fact, but we were both usually last. So uh, I know what it felt like to not be chosen. You know, today you even have that commercial, I choose Barkley. Well, yeah, that's a no-brainer. I'll take Barkley any day. So, but what does it mean to be acceptable to God? What was the criminal? What did he do? What was his words that made Jesus say, I take you? We're going to look at these, this story today from two different perspectives. The do's and the don'ts of acceptance in the eyes of God. So we're going to look at first the don'ts. When it comes to being accepted by God, the first don't, the first thing we don't want to do, we, start, we think about in this story of the thief, is you don't have to be sinless in order to be accepted by God. The thief, by any stretch of the imagination, we know was not a good guy. After all, he was going to be crucified on a cross, a Roman crucifixion. Now, we know that it, for a Roman crucifixion to take place, this guy had to do something pretty horrible in order to have this form, the worst form of capital punishment. So we can all pretty well confirm that he was not a good guy and he did something very horrible. Most likely he committed murder or some type of a crime like that. In the ancient days, you always had the ability, if you did something wrong, to repay your debt, being an indentured servant or some debt to society. But this guy didn't have that option because the crime was so bad, he didn't have an option to repay any of his death. His crucifixion was merited by his own actions. And that's why he confessed that to Jesus when he said on the cross, he said, we, or to his buddy, I should say, we are getting what we deserve. He knew that he was a sinner. He knew he did something wrong. And he was ready to accept the penalty for that being death on a cross. Both in Matthew and Mark's account of the same uh, story, they talk about the two thieves both insulting Jesus first before the second thief repents. So they both had bad words. So what was it about the second thief that all of a sudden he realized, wait a second, this guy in the middle between us, there's something different about him. What is different about him? And he actually says, he does not deserve this. We deserve it, but he doesn't. He recognized Jesus for who he is. So you think about this criminal hanging on a cross, blood dripping from his face, beaten, swollen, in pain. He knows he's being crucified because of his crimes. But at some point, he steps over the threshold of eternity with Christ. He's doing something right. He's doing something. He got Jesus' attention. An hour or so after they started mocking Jesus, they recognize, or this one recognizes who Jesus is, and Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. Think about that for a moment. What are your sins? Why are they so important for us to consider? Are all of our sins, is they, do they preclude us from getting to heaven? Are our sins so terrible that God is not going to let us in? No, because of the blood of Jesus. 
There are some of us sitting here today who feel we have committed the unpardonable sin, just like this guy on the cross. Maybe you're watching online and you know that maybe you had an abortion. You were a thief in your past life. You did something so terrible you know you don't deserve heaven. But guess what? Jesus said, I take you. We have to make sure that we understand no matter what we've done in our lives, Jesus wants you to be with him in paradise. Maybe you feel that there's no way that God could ever take you after what you've done in your life. If that's the way you feel today, look more closely at what this story is saying. Look at this man's life. Is your life worse than his? Whatever your sin is, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. No one is excluded from the infinite mercy of Jesus, no matter how great their sin is. We don't have to be sinless to be accepted by God. The first truth that we want to learn about from this story is none of us are perfect, and we all need God's grace. The second don't. We don't have to do good works to be accepted by God. If the thief's acceptance had been based on good works, then he could have never been saved. Remember, he was nailed to a cross. He was hung on a tree. How was he going to get down long enough to do enough good works, walk enough old ladies across the street in order to be saved? It could never happen. Just like Jesus, this man's hands and feet were nailed to the cross. <clears throat> While good works is not required for salvation, it is something that we need to do after acceptance, after salvation, because we want to say, thank you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all the things that you have done in my life. Let me pay it back. Let me pay it forward. So we want to follow Jesus. We want to do what he does. We want to emulate Jesus and all the things that he has done, not only in his life, but in our lives as well. Bernie talked about that a little, a couple, uh, two weeks ago when he was talking about good works. All this criminal could do was to speak a few measly words to Jesus in the midst of all his, his agony as he was hanging on that tree without any hope. So that's the question I need you to think about. What would you have told this thief if you had been there that day? Well, if you want salvation, well, you know, you're going to have to get down from that cross first. We're going to have to put you in the water. We're going to have to baptize you. You're going to have to be acceptable to God first. You're going to have to do this, 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 and this in order to be acceptable. Maybe you're going to have him say 10 Hail Marys and a couple of Our Fathers and do some penance, and that'll get you, that'll get him into a heaven. This man couldn't go to church. This man couldn't get down from the cross. This man was without any hope. He couldn't go and do anything in order to earn his salvation. All he could do was ask Jesus to take him with him, to be with him in paradise. And he had to do a couple other things, and we're going to get to that as some of our dues in a few minutes. Because he was on the cross, he was left with no hope. But listen carefully to what this story actually says, and it's the essence of salvation. Even if he could do something for yourself, it doesn't matter. Doing all the great works you want in your life is not going to earn you salvation. Nothing you can do is going to pardon you from your sins. You can't be an indentured servant. You can't do any of those things in order to get you into heaven. The only way to earn salvation is to repent of your sins, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and be baptized in his name. 
period, end of discussion, because that's what the scriptures tell us. And God's grace then will cover all of your sins. That's, and we're going to talk about that when we get to that communion table, because that's what that communion table represents. So your works are not going to make you acceptable to God. None of us will ever be good enough to earn salvation. We get it freely because of God's grace. Christianity is the only religion where we must rely on somebody else, the death and burial of Jesus Christ, in order to get to heaven. Everyone else, you have to earn it by doing something. Christians believe it is not what they do, but what Jesus does in changing our lives, transforming us. It goes back, remember Romans 2.12, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by a renewing of your mind. That makes us acceptable, helps us to be acceptable in God's eyes. We have to make sure that when God enters into us, we start to change. We let God change us from the inside out. We get to that point of forgiveness that we talked about last week. It's on Jesus that helps us get to heaven because of his sacrifice, not ours. Again, all we have to do is accept that free gift. So you don't have to do good works in order to be accepted in the eyes of God. So the don'ts. First, we don't have to be sinless to be accepted by God. And second, we don't have to do good works to be accepted by God either. Now, we don't have to do these things, so well, then what do we have to do for God to say, I take you and you and you? Well, the answer to that we're going to look at what the do's are of acceptance. When it comes to being accepted by God, we find this in that same story. We do not have to acknowledge, well, excuse me, we do have to acknowledge that we are sinners. Luke 23, verses 39 and 40. One of the criminals hung there, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what, we, what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Remember, we talked about this on Easter. We are all sinners. This is a recovery meeting. We are all recovering sinners. We have to make sure that we understand that. And that's the first do, is we have to make sure we confess that we are sinners. Two thieves hanging on that cross, but only one of them is willing to admit that he is guilty of the sins charged. This repentant thief, in that moment before his death, admits that he and his, and his partner were being punished justly for their actions. They had both broken the law, they were both guilty, and they were both about to receive their deserved punishment. But only one criminal made no excuse. He didn't try to cover up his mistake. He didn't make light of his sinful nature. He just said, I'm a sinner and I'm guilty. All of us today are guilty of some form of disobedience just like these two criminals. But for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ and have been baptized in his name, his grace continues to cover us. And we just have to say, I'm sorry, Father, forgive me. All of us in some way have violated the commands of God and are guilty as charged. The Bible says that all of us have fallen short of God's glory and his grace because of our sins. But just like this crucifixion scene, there are some of us who take the side of the stubborn thief, who refuse to admit, I'm a sinner. Some of you are choosing to go through life glossing over your sins, or maybe trying to cover them up, or even denying them altogether. 
oh, that's not a sin. I, that, that's okay. It's just a, it, it's nothing. It's okay. I can do that. I can handle it. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I got it under control. To those of us who refuse to call ourselves sinners, there are no words of comfort from Jesus. Jesus has nothing to say. He will just remain silent as he did for that third thief. Remember, only one of them he said those words to. But for others here today, you, like the repentant thief, are willing to acknowledge your sins. You are ready, ready, willing, and able to say, I'm a sinner. You have rebelled against God, and I want to turn. I want to turn from my evil ways and get back on the right path. You aren't trying to justify your deeds any longer. You confess with your mouth that you deserved the punishment of death. You are the ones who will be greeted with the loving eyes of Jesus, knowing that you have repented and he has accepted you into his kingdom. Of the two criminals, only one was saved. Only a one acknowledged that he was a sinner. Only one heard Jesus say, I take you. You will be with me in paradise. So you do have to admit you are a sinner. Remember what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. He said, repent. That's telling I'm a sinner. Repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus and you will be saved. You can't be baptized until after repentance. I know there are churches out there that like to baptize infants. Infants can't repent. They don't know what repentance is. They haven't learned that yet. That's why we wait until somebody is old enough to make sure they understand what repentance is and why they need to be baptized. Remember, remember we are all recovering, recovering addicts. We are all addicted to sin. Now, the second do to be accepted by God is we do have to believe and trust that Jesus is the Lord, the Son of the living God. I seriously doubt that before this guy got nailed to a cross, he even knew who Jesus was. He might have heard about him, but he didn't follow his ministry. His, he wasn't one of his disciples, obviously. This guy probably just heard Jesus' name in passing. He and the other thief heaped these verbal insults on Jesus. But all of a sudden, according to the scriptures, he woke up and he recognizes that he is a convicted felon deserving of death. But more importantly, he's realizing that Jesus is not deserving. He realizes that Jesus was more than a man. That maybe, maybe Jesus is who he says he is. Just like the song we just sang a few minutes ago. Maybe this criminal saw the sign above Jesus' head that said, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. And he actually believed that to be true. In that terrible hour, right in the middle of this painful, slow death, the fear of God sweeps over this man. How do we know that he trusted Jesus at that point? Because verse 42 says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say when you get to heaven. He didn't say when you go up to, to be in, in the next realm. He said when you enter into your kingdom kingdom. He recognized that Jesus was the king he said he was. Suddenly he sees Jesus as a ruler of the kingdom and not just some ordinary man dying on a cross. All at once he saw Jesus for who he really was. King of kings and Lord of lords. That is when he has his aha moment. And at that very moment, he turned and asked Jesus to remember him when he comes to his heavenly throne. He's reached the end of his life, and suddenly he realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. So let me ask you a question. 
Have you been living in sin and unbelief for most of your life? Do you know that in a moment you can be made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ just like this robber was? By the words of God, I believe that in a single moment, any one of us, whether we're 60 or 70, can have all of our unbelief wiped away, all of our sin absolutely forgiven. That is the way it is with man, and that is the way it can be with every person in this room that don't already accept Jesus as the Christ. So now, this thief has expressed his faith. What was he going to do next? Well, obviously, he couldn't get down from the cross. All he had to do was say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, the, we, the way we express our trust in Christ is to do two things. One is to confess our faith. Romans 10, 9 says, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the second thing we do is to express our faith in Christ is to be baptized into him. Mark 16, 16 says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Sometimes people say, well, the thief on the cross didn't get baptized. I don't have to get baptized. A couple of reasons why that can't be true. First, he physically couldn't get down from the cross. I firmly believe that if somebody is on their deathbed and they accept Christ as their Savior at that point in time in their life, that God will accept that sacrifice, just like this thief on the cross. But there are other reasons why this thief on the cross didn't need to be baptized. Second point, he was still under the Old Testament. Christ had not been raised from the dead. He had not been buried. He had not finished all of those steps. He had not paid the sacrifice for everybody's sin. He was still under the Old Testament law. We are under the New Testament law. Different requirements. The New Testament did not begin until after the death of burial and resurrection of Christ, rival of the Holy Spirit. And another point, he's Jesus. Let's not forget that. He's Jesus. He can do whatever he wants. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. How many people did he raise from the death, from dead during his ministry? Again, Old Testament, not New Testament. Last thing is, you're not there. You can't choose that as a way out, that you don't have to be baptized. And why somebody would say, I don't need to be baptized, when scriptures talk about it so tremendously, blows my mind sometimes. Why? Because you don't want to get wet? You take a bath every week, don't you? Sometimes we have to do things that are uncomfortable. Sometimes we have to do what God tells us to do, even if we don't think we need it. We have an opportunity to have spend eternity with God. Our eternal destiny is to be with him if we choose. So God can say, I choose you and you and you. Right there on that cross, Jesus gave the repentant thief exactly what he requested. The Lord answers your quest for forgiveness and redemption immediately upon the expression of true faith. The thief on the cross likewise found peace regarding the matter of death. Home was just around the corner, just beyond the cross, and so can you. So as we wrap this up today, as we get ready to close, do you want peace that peace that transcends all understanding? Do you want to die in your sleep? Do you know where you're going to go if you do today? It could happen today. Do you know where you're going to go? This is your hour to come to Christ and hear Jesus say, 
I take you. On a warm Sunday afternoon, there was a loving father and his son. They went to the village cemetery to see the grave of a small child. And they stood at the gravestone. And the youngster asked, Daddy, when you die and go to heaven, will you take me with you? The father was startled by this question. And he inquired, why do you ask that? And the boy takes his hand and says, Daddy, I don't want you to go alone. If that's you, if you need to have Jesus in your life, if you need to have that repentance, to speak to God, to ask him to be with you, to take you with him into paradise. And as we sing this song, I ask you to stand as we get ready and prepare for communion. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for the message today, Lord, and we thank you that you do choose us, Lord, even though we're undeserving, even though we are sinners, you do cover us with your grace. There's nothing, there's no many, how many thank yous, Lord, is enough. Lord, but we say it each and every day. Thank you. Thank you for all you do for us, Lord. Lord, and if there's any person here today that is ready to confess that they are a sinner and in need of that salvation, Lord, I pray, Lord, that they may come forward now as we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.